You can't do the housework. You don't even have a job. How long are you going to stay here? About two months after my husband passed away, I was secretly looking through an album filled with memories of him, and my mother-in-law said to me hatefully, "Besides, you are a stranger, not one of our family members, and you're crying like this to show off. Do you think you are the victim?" No, that's not what I meant. I lost my precious son, and all I am left with is my failed and brazen daughter-in-law. I'm the one who wants to cry, not you. When my husband was alive, and even after he passed away, I worked my butt off to provide for James and my mother-in-law. I worked and worked. I did all the housework to meet my mother-in-law's needs. And now I am being treated like a stranger. You were just a caretaker, and you're no longer needed. So, get the hell out of my house. Okay. I want you to pack your bags by the end of the day. I've got no wife to bother me, and now the house and the car are mine. My mother-in-law smiled happily. I had noticed something, but I didn't tell my mother-in-law. I have been used and abused so much in the past. Let her go through a little bit of hell. I can't wait to see the look on my mother-in-law's face when she finds out. The whole story starts a decade ago. I married my husband James, and now we live with him and my mother-in-law. James's father passed away when James was in high school, and when we were dating, James lived at home with his mother. He was going to move out of his parents' house when he got married, and started living with me. But his mother didn't want that, because she was lonely and she strongly wanted him to live with her. So we ended up moving in all together when we got married. We had saved money together before we got married, and we built a house at the same time we got married. So my mother-in-law was going to live there with us. James and I both wanted to have children. But eight years ago, James got in a car accident that left him paralyzed and in need of care. It became difficult for us to have children, and James even suggested that we divorce because I was taking care of him. But I didn't want to divorce him, so I persistently persuaded him that I would take care of him, and we decided to stay married. Housework, job, and taking care of James. I resigned from my job and began writing from home because it had become difficult for me to work outside the home. As a student, I had been writing columns and blogs on the internet part time, and the company I worked for was also in the publishing field, so I was occasionally asked to write small articles. It was an incredibly busy time, but I was happy to be able to spend a lot of time with James. Who had been so busy with his work that we barely had time to spend together. James took care of me, and even when I was getting used to taking care of him, he would never forget to thank me. I think we had a fulfilling and happy marriage, except for one thing: my mother-in-law. Before James's car accident, my mother-in-law was a quiet person who didn't talk much. She spoke kindly to me. And although she didn't seem to be very good at housework, I got the impression that she was a classy woman who enjoyed the gardening and watching the theater. She thinks it's a woman's job to do the housework perfectly. When I served him prepared food for dinner on days when I came home tired from work, she would say, "I can't believe you put this kind of food on the table." On my days off, when James did the laundry for me. She said she can't believe that I let him do the housework, but that was a few times. I didn't mind because she just laughed then and said that things were different now compared to the past, and that she was sorry. But after James got in a car accident, she took advantage of the fact that he didn't see me and started to go against me more and more. She used to take care of herself. Now she puts all the housework on me, 
saying it's just added work and that she doesn't think it will make a difference with one more person to take care of. She never used to say anything about buying food for her or James, but now she checks what I buy without her permission and blames me for wasting money if there is even a small amount of sweets. No matter how much I loved James and how fulfilled he made me feel every day, to be honest, I was physically and mentally exhausted. My mother-in-law's sarcasm hit hard on me. On top of that, my mother-in-law didn't understand the work of a work-at-home writer. So, when I was working in my room or living room, she thought I was playing on a computer and she would sarcastically criticize me. She also asked me to go buy fruits at the supermarket even when I'm working. To tell the truth, I was getting tired of living with my mother-in-law. But I didn't want to worry James because James thought that she and I were getting along well. She was a nice and calm person with some sharp words, but she never yelled at me or threw things. So I decided to ignore her and let her get on with her life. After living like this for quite a long time, when I got used to caring for James and living with my mother-in-law, suddenly James collapsed and passed away. It was a subraconite hemorrhage. I was unprepared for the suddenness of it all, and I couldn't even say goodbye to him. There were so many things I had to do. I had asked my supervisor of the writer's job, and I had been given extended deadlines. Our house is a mess because of all the housework I haven't done. But I don't feel like doing anything. No matter what I did, it didn't feel real, and I felt as if I was detached from myself. I don't feel alive, yet I get hungry and sleepy every day. My body is trying to live while my mind was abundant living. It was strange. I didn't care about anything. But only thing that kept me sane through it all was my concern for my mother-in-law. After James passed away, my mother-in-law became a different person. She started raising her voice at the slightest thing. Once, when the housework was out of control, I didn't notice a little dust on the TV. My mother-in-law saw that. Why can't you even do this level of the housework? There's still dust here. Can't you see it? She exclaimed hysterically. My mother-in-law, who had never raised her voice, no matter how sarcastic she was, now cried out devilishly. I'm sorry. I'll clean up right away. Please, come down. Who the hell do you think you are? I'm calm. Get on with the cleaning. I'm sorry. I'll do it right now. I can't believe she can't even do this. What a lousy wife he got. I tried to soothe her. But her mood kept getting worse. And once she raised her voice, she was out of control. She had lost her husband early and her precious only son. So, no wonder. It would be dangerous to leave my mother-in-law alone in this condition. And I would feel bad for James, who was worried about her. I decided to live together with my mother-in-law. When I made this decision, strangely enough, I suddenly felt the energy to live. The day had been like walking on a cloud. I was like a lost child. But suddenly, everything became a reality for me. I was working faster and more efficiently than ever before. And I cleaned up every single mess in my house. I prepared healthier meals than I had when James was here and tried to include as many of my mother-in-law's favorite side dishes as possible. Whenever I had some free time at work, I even invited my mother-in-law to go to the theater with me, hoping that she would feel a little refreshed. However, my mother-in-law's hysterics did not stop. In fact, they seemed to intensify day by day. I told myself every day that it wasn't hard, and I tried my best to live with my mother-in-law while thinking about James. But one day, 
everything suddenly became hard, as if a thread had been cut. Suddenly, I wanted to see James. I opened an album of photos of James, as if I was being drowned to it. I was so taken aback by the many smiling faces of James in the album, but I couldn't help but gasp. James was looking at me with my favorite smile. From the time we met to after we were married, I reached out for James, but all I felt was cold. I can no longer hear his voice. I can no longer touch him. I felt like I was being reminded of something so obvious. I couldn't help but shed a tear or two. Once they flowed, they flowed one after another like a dam. I cried aloud like a child. I have never cried with such emotion since James left. I could feel that someone was there, so I turned around and saw my mother in law, who was supposed to be out of the house, quietly staring at me. I hurriedly wiped away my tears. Welcome home. I'm sorry. I'll get the dinner ready right away. With that, I put the album away and hurriedly got up. I'm sure my eyes are bloodshot and swollen, so I'm sure she knows I've been crying. I'm about to walk past my mother-in though, when she stops me and says, "Lily, why are you crying?" Yes, I'm sorry I showed you my embarrassment. My mother-in law stared at me with emotionless eyes. I was hoping that my mother-in law might say something comforting or encouraging at the moment. No matter how sarcastic she might normally be, we were both people who had lost loved ones. I thought we shared the same pain, but what my mother-in-law said to me was something I never expected. You are not a family member, but you are playing a victim. You're such a nasty woman. You are a stranger, not family. I'm sure you are not sad that James is gone. You went to all this trouble to make a show of it, and you cried like a liar. No, I was not acting. I'm sad about James too. You're full of lies. I'm tired of living with you. You were just a caretaker. How long do you think you were going to stay here? Get your stuff and get out of here. I was too shocked to say anything to my mother-in-law. I thought I had been supporting my mother-in-law for a long time, even though my heart was worn out. I knew she was probably grieving more than I was, so I didn't expect her to be grateful to me. I felt like by supporting and comforting my mother-in-law, she was also comforting me in my suffering. But I had no idea that my mother-in-law thought of me this way. If she had said it to me while she was in a state of hysterics, I might have been able to let it go. But when my mother-in-law said it to me in a calm state, I was at my wit's end. Did my mother-in-law think like that from the bottom of her heart? I decided to leave the house. That night, when I told my mother-in-law that I was leaving the house, she smiled and nodded calmly as before. I felt sorry for my mother-in-law to get her out of the house, who was not working, so I decided to give her the house. I asked her what I should do with the car, which had originally belonged to James's father, and had been given to James to take care of, and she happily told me to leave it all behind. I was worried about whether it would be okay, but my mother-in-law strongly insisted that I leave it behind, so I had no choice. It was hard for me to live with all the memories of James too, because I remembered the happy times when we were together. So I decided to give them all to my mother-in-law. After James passed away, I changed the name of the house and the car to me. But now I changed everything to my mother-in-law's name. My mother-in-law was so happy after everything was done, and she happily said that everything was hers now. Will you be all right? I want to give them back to you, even if you ask me to do so now. It's all mine now. But with the insurance and everything, I've always dreamed of living alone in a house. Oh yes, I should buy new furniture too. 
Let's throw out all this uninspired furniture in this house. My mother-in-law didn't seem to hear a word I said. My mother-in-law was so excited about her new life that I decided to quickly find a new apartment and move in. For the first time in a long time, living alone was calm and comfortable. No one yelled at me out of the blue. No one interfered with my work. I wish I had done this earlier and regretted it a little. A few weeks later, I suddenly received a phone call from my mother-in-law. When I picked up the phone, my mother-in-law screamed at me. Lady, what's going on? What do you mean? Don't play dumb with me. I didn't know it was going to cost this much to pay the taxes on the house. The insurance, the car. I asked you if the insurance and everything will be okay for you. I don't remember. You didn't ask. I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. You pay it instead of me. I'm a pensioner, so I don't have that kind of money. You said that it would be okay and inherited everything. Shut up. And if you are my daughter-in-law, you should at least pay this. We're a family. Oh, you mean I'm a family member? No, no. I'm just a stranger to you. I'm just a caregiver. Beatrice, you told me to leave. I can't take care of someone else than me now. You have to take care of yourself. With that, I hung up the phone without hearing my mother-in-law's reply. After that, she called me again and again, so I blocked her phone number. Then, after a while, my aunt called me. She said that my mother-in-law, who did not know where I was, had contacted all my relatives and was looking for me. My aunt, who was worried about me, contacted me to see if something had happened. I explained to her what had happened, and she just laughed at my mother-in-law and told me about her current situation. She told me that she had sold the house, the car, and everything else because she was having trouble making the payments. However, since my mother-in-law was raised in a wealthy family, had an arranged marriage, and was a naive young lady who had never worked, so did not know the market price of houses and cars, so she sold all of them at a very low price. Now she lives in an old apartment with low rent. She often visits her relatives and says that she hates her old house and blames everything on me. Some of her relatives are having a hard time dealing with her. And recently, some of them have even turned her away instead of letting her in the house when she visits them. At first, some relatives care about my mother-in-law, but she took other people's kindness for granted. So the number of people who cared about her gradually decreased. She has been living a lonely life, refraining from her hobbies such as gardening and going to the theater. I thanked my aunt for the information, asked her not to talk to my mother-in-law about me, and then quickly hung up the phone. I had just gotten my life back, and I didn't want my mother-in-law to interfere with it again. Although the sadness of not having James has never healed, I am enjoying my new life, surrounded by my writer friends and the friends in the social activity program I recently joined.